Hi, this is Andy Hoffman of CryptoGoldCentral.com, the sound money blog of the 21st century, in which I write daily of my vision of the future of money, in which Bitcoin is the center of the universe. Try my free seven-day trial membership and contact me at ahoffman at CryptoGoldCentral.com to arrange cryptocurrency consultations. Today, I have a first-time guest on the show, who was so impressive on Adam Meister's This Week in Bitcoin a few weeks back, I made it a point to have him as my guest as well. That man is Zach Vol, who not only can be found at at Zach Vol, that's Z-A-C-K-V-O-E-L-L, -L, but does weekly cryptocurrency-related podcasts on a separate Twitter feed, at The Coin Pod. To that end, Zach, welcome to One on One. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's uh, a blast being here. I look forward to jumping into um, a whole bunch of different things today. Thanks for inviting me on. You're welcome. And we do have several very important things to talk of today, starting with the biggest pink elephant in the history of pink elephants in cryptocurrency, i.e. the Mt. Gox trustee, who per yesterday evening's tweet, I am extremely confident that he is the principal reason why Bitcoin plunged from 10,000 on May 4th to 8100 May 15th. In fact, I just did another tweet upgrading my odds that he is responsible for that from 90% up to 100%. Now, what we the reason being that after 16,000 Bitcoin were moved from his cold wallet on April 25th, not once did Bitcoin experience a significant decline. At the time, the price was $8,900, after which it rose nearly nonstop to nearly $10,000 on May 4th. However, starting first thing Monday morning, Asia time on May 6th, every bid was hit from 10,000 to 9,000 over the next two days. And then on Thursday, May 10th, just as I was conducting my must listen Simon Dixon one on one, another 8,000 Bitcoin left the Mt. Gox trustees cold wallets for a total of 24,000 Bitcoin worth $220 million. Mere hours later, with the price having stabilized in the high 9,300s, another violent bombing raid commenced that continued for the next six days until finally on Monday and Tuesday this week, with the price approaching 8,000, the vicious, obviously price insensitive seller backed off, apparently with a price limit after all. Then yesterday, it couldn't be more obvious that a mysterious, relentless seller was camped out at $8,400, selling every last Bitcoin bid in the, up in that area, as clearly selling below 8,300 started to dry up. Now this morning, 12 after, after scripting what I just said, I feel more confident than ever after having watched the overnight action as unquestionably a huge seller is camped out in the high 8,300s, which in my view, the market is starting to discount by raising its floor to the 8,200s, playing a classic game of attrition in this tight trading range, knowing full well Bitcoin is dramatically undervalued and at the same time, capped by one of the few entities with a position large enough to do so and motivation i might add which in my mind is with a hundred percent certainty or close to it the mount gox uh, trustee so with that elaborate introduction to an extremely important topic in my view the topic that matters right now i'd like to hear your view zach regarding how much of the recent price action you would with your best guess attribute attribute to the mount gox bear well if at all also, given that he now holds just 1.2 billion worth, what's your best guess as to how this scenario will play out in the market? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting um, little bit of the price action to watch, and one 1.2 billion is no uh, no pocket change worth of Bitcoin. Um, I I can't promise that I'm 100% certain that the uh, Mt. Gox trustee is responsible for the recent price action. I think it's, um, without a doubt, a relevant factor. Um, I think it's a little bit irritating to almost anyone in the space, regardless of whether or not you are a day trader or pretty much don't care at all about the day-to-day -day price action, that someone with such a large amount of Bitcoin handles it responsibly and just sort of open market dumping <laughs> doesn't really fit the definition of responsible. Um, but I think um, Tour, who's much more brilliant than I am, I really don't claim to be brilliant at all. He's he, super whip sharp guy. He was tweeting the other day um, when some of this price uh, slumping started um, that he thinks, at least I think it was Tour, I could have that wrong, but um, 
he was tweeting that the Bitcoin today compared to Mt. Gox when it, the price first crashed back in uh, 2013, 2014, Bitcoin is a little bit more developed. And that's sort of an understatement to the point that these sell offs probably couldn't affect Bitcoin as much as we've seen the price fall recently. And I tend to subscribe to that idea or that approach to the Mt. Gox trustee more than um, maybe pinning 100% of the blame for the price fall on him. Um, I'm I'm not really sure. I, I can't uh, claim that I pay a ton of attention to his addresses and the movement of his Bitcoins. I know that um, a bunch of whales and other casually interested persons have alerts set up for when those coins move um, and all that sort of thing. I'm just, I'm just not, I think the market has developed beyond the point where that one trustee, regardless of how much Bitcoin he has, can plummet the price so much, um, and which I think is a positive thing. I <laughs> would love if the trustee handled his Bitcoin more responsibly and sold it off in other ways. Um, but I don't think he is the sole party culpable for the Bitcoin crash, if that makes sense. So I would push back on that a little bit, I guess. But that's just my opinion. Absolutely. And actually, by when I say the, you know, he's 100 percent responsible, I, of course, don't mean that that's the only reason prices fall. We obviously had a huge uh, run up which uh, even I would, would call a short-term bubble what happened, uh, particularly in altcoins in January, but even Bitcoin to an extent before that in, in December. Uh, so yes, I mean, you have many factors at play, but it's you, it can't be dismissed the fact that 35,000 Bitcoin were withdrawn from the, uh, the Mt. Gox trustee's wallets starting on the day of the top, December 17th, uh, ending on the day of the bottom uh, when 8,000 uh, were taken out of his wallet on February 6th, and that's when the price went to 6,000. And then we didn't see any more movement from the wallets as the price just started to stabilize. So again, a lot of factors in play, but clearly yeah. uh, this was a big a big one, a big factor and certainly a catalyst. And uh, you know, you, you talk, we talk again about responsibly, and this will be uh, the next thing we talk about uh, regarding this, is... Um, this is obviously not being done responsibly because you mentioned no pocket change. Uh, maybe in the past, a billion dollars is no pocket change. But when you have a $160 billion market cap in a $300 trillion legacy financial market, uh, it really is pocket change for many uh, big institutions. Certainly institutions like, say, the Bank of Japan, who has probably direct uh, <laughs> direct um, you know conversations with the Mt. Gox whale. So there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of questions in my mind about if this is being done with fiduciary responsibility as a primary uh, goal. I'm not even sure what the rules are in Japan. Uh, but you know, what do yeah. you think? Do you think that uh, that that this is being done in a fiduciarily responsible way, or is there some other thoughts you might have? Um, well, I guess to clarify, in terms of the entire global financial market um 1.2 billion is definitely pocket change i i was sort of um contextualizing it in terms of the bitcoin market cap and if anyone listening has thirty five thousand bitcoin please don't follow suit with the mount gox trustee we would all be extremely grateful um i think um I, I wouldn't necessarily slap the label of reckless or violating some sort of fiduciary duty necessarily. And that may be a misguided opinion, uh, admittedly from sort of an uh, underdeveloped ignorance um, of the entire situation. I think it's, well, I don't think, I know that there are better ways to sell off that Bitcoin and open market dumping is not one of them. Um, and... I, I think that's just sort of the entire story from uh, front cover to back cover, case closed. There are more responsible ways to get rid of those Bitcoin. And um, actually, next week, um, I'm releasing a podcast with Mark Yesko, the CEO of Morgan Creep Capital. Um, and we were chatting about b uh, bigger financial players like Goldman getting into the space. And he made the comment relevant to the sell off here that those big players will make selling off large amounts of Bitcoin much more quiet, much easier, and will, is a, is a move, attractive to uh, Bitcoin whales who may be looking to 
get rid of some of their Bitcoin, whether or not, whether it's because they want some cash or they just sort of don't want to have such an enormous wall of Bitcoin and sort of ideologically want to disperse um, or uh, make the ownership of Bitcoin globally more even, that sort of thing. People love to chirp at the fact that a lot of Bitcoin is centralized in a couple massive wallets. Um, and the Mt. Cox trustees should take advantage of some of those much more quiet, much more manageable ways of selling off all this Bitcoin. But again, I can't really comment on whether or not it violates a fiduciary duty per se. It's just um, sort of casually reckless at 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 uh, at best. Yeah, absolutely. Look, when I worked uh, back on Wall Street uh, in the uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s, especially when I was at Solomon uh, working in the oil field service sector as an analyst, you know, we had all the time. We had management, uh, tightly held companies, and they had a stake to sell. Uh, he had a divorce settlement. Uh, he was just getting out of the business. So what you do is you contact uh, the trading desk and you say, I have a non-fundamental reason to sell a significant amount. And what they do is they call up the institutions and tell them, and guess what would happen? They'd all bid the thing like crazy and usually sell it at a price above the market value. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's exactly what would happen if this was done in OTC markets responsibly. It may take you know, Bitcoin is less developed uh, market than, say, like uh, U.S. equities. But there's plenty of, of firms out there that can if you give them a week, they'll contact everyone and they will put a block together and they'll trade thirty seven thousand Bitcoin, probably at ten thousand dollars instead of at eight thousand. It's that simple. Uh, yeah. So I don't know what their what what their goal is, uh, if there's anything nefarious about it or it's just uh, they just don't know what they're doing. But there's no way in my mind that what they're doing now you know, I wrote a tweet yesterday and I said, you know, the, the borderline malicious um, lack of transparency is what's hurting the price right now because people are going, well, does he did he sell it all? Does he have 10,000 that's sitting right there? Are we going to look up uh, this afternoon and up another 8,000 left and bam, the price goes down $1,000. At the same time, you know, what I've been saying all along is that and what, exactly what you're talking about and what Tor Demis was talking about is, there's more demand, there's more liquidity. I mean, Goldman Sachs is coming and bringing their clients, for instance, more people want to buy. Uh, so for people to say, well, the Mt. Gox guy is gonna sell, so the price has to go to 5,000 or 4,000, 3,000, no. It just means it's gonna get absorbed by more and more players. And that's what's so exciting, like what Tor is saying. Yeah, that we can, we can maintain the sell-offs at much higher prices. I mean, look at how much was sold and yet the lowest price was six thousand dollars, which a year ago we were at one thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, I I think it's it blows me away. And I know that uh, Pierre and Michael tweet about this all the time that like the fact that we're even having this conversation. Holy smokes, Bitcoin is going to crash to five thousand dollars or three thousand dollars just like melts my brain. Like I I bought my first Bitcoin when you could buy it with a single piece of paper. It wasn't two dollars or fifty dollars or anything but i could still buy one bitcoin with one denomination of a dollar bill and now we're talking about crashing to six thousand dollars and i'm like hey i'll take it i it's phenomenal um and i think i think i would add also sort of tangentially related that it also makes me it, it tickles me a little bit how fixated a lot of people are on um, and this isn't to discount the uh, relevance of the Bitcoin of the Mt. Gox trustee Bitcoin sell off, but it tickles me how hungry we are oftentimes for any sort of narrative to fit the Bitcoin price behavior, short term Bitcoin price behavior. Um, someone was tweeting this morning before we started the show that some of the recent slump over the past week, everyone was expecting like this huge consensus bump and it didn't happen. In fact, the price, the price slumped a little bit. And so the new theory is it slumped because people were selling off Bitcoin to travel to New York or something for the conference. <laughs> like, how, how desperate are we guys? Like sometimes the price does things that we don't like. And sometimes it does things we do like it goes up, it goes down, it goes sideways. And maybe we don't know why. And that's totally okay. So um, I think one of the more likely theories for the recent price action is the Mt. Gox trustee um, market selling. But right. it just it's sometimes we can take a break from narrative constructing and just sort of let the price do what it does and and call it a day. So Right. All, all else equal. And whether the, the uh, Mt. Gox trustee is, in fact, the primary uh, contributor, which I believe. But, you know, I can't prove it. I just believe it. Um, the fact is that Bitcoin is still a very illiquid market. It's a technology that's changing the world and has 
a lot of powerful enemies out there and a lot of powerful friends. And therefore, with this relatively low liquidity, which is a lot more liquidity than it used to be, it's subject to incredibly uh, large moves either direction. That's just the fact that Bitcoin, which people have been in for a long time, hate, uh, but we deal with and people are in uh, for the first time. Most of them don't deal with it and they want to get out of it. That's just a fact. And, you know, you talk about how we're we're so jaded that we can't believe we're worried about crashing the 5,000. But the fact is, as you know, you know, losing something that you had uh, is worse than never having it. And especially when it comes to Bitcoin, the, the level, because it's such a new and uncertain um, entity, the, you know, you're always subject to FUD. Like, oh, no, it's down to, to 9,000. It's going to go to 2,000. And this guy says that. And, you know, it's it's, it's still... It's much better than it was, but it's still very scary. So that brings me to the related question of whether or not the crypto bear market is over, which I officially declared April 12th, for what, whatever that's worth, the day the price surged from 6,800 to 8,200 in the highest volume hour of Bitcoin trading in its nine-year nine history. Since then, the price surged to 10,000 before the recent spate of selling. But more importantly, in what I view as a decidedly bull market phenomenon, altcoins have dramatically outperformed. As most of you know, I've been particularly vehement in refuting the claims of a well-known Bitcoin technical analyst who claims we are still in a bear market, which of course neither of us will know for sure except in hindsight. Zach, with the caveat that you two are only doing your best to make an educated guess, what's your view of whether the crypto bear market is indeed over? And if not, what do you think needs to occur time and or event wise for it, for this to happen? Well, Andy, I could actually, uh, I I'm clairvoyant, so I can tell you with <laughs> Good. That the, uh, the bear market is over. Um, no, I, I would tend to agree with that thesis. I think I know the, uh, pretty well-known technical analysts you're referencing. And, um, I think, I think, again, going back to, so I should sort of uh, add an addendum to the comment I made about it being hilarious. We're worried about crashing to 6,000 because if someone bought at 14,000, a crash to 6,000 doesn't feel that great. Um, but I think worrying over that crash might betray a little bit of ignorance on Bitcoin's historical price behavior, that being this is not the first rodeo for bitcoin crashing 70 80 85 percent it's happened before just with the dollar amounts being smaller but the percentages are the same and so if you're worried about it um i i would encourage you not to be um but with regard to the bear market i think uh i i say this somewhat facetiously but also 50 percent seriously i think we've never been in it in a crypto bear market because well for two reasons i guess one i see bitcoin as the only so-called crypto that matters um and you can't really have a bear market with only one meaningful asset um but also when people talk about equities and things we look at like five-year returns 10-year returns and that sort of thing and if you look at those those returns during that time frame for bitcoin your mind will melt it's the most incredible thing in the world and so even if we've had for one or two months or a year or something, um, Bitcoin slump from 20,000 to 9,000, 8,000, what have you, um, that's uncomfortable for people who bought the top, but look at a, just zoom out, I guess, and look at the bigger picture and, and you'll be okay. Um, now with regards to any of you listening who may be like sort of swing traders and have a lot of altcoin bags, um, I, my opinion on that really isn't worth hearing because I don't have a great opinion. I'm not super involved in that aspect of the space. Um, I think we, I, I look at charts on trading view every now and then for different altcoins that a bunch of my friends chirp at me about. Um, and I think we've seen massive crashes in almost all of them and they've sort of maybe plateaued at a bottom for the past couple of weeks. Um, so maybe we bottomed out and maybe the, uh, a bull market for altcoins is about to return. I'm not entirely sure, but I think we've never been in a bear market for Bitcoin. We're still very much in a bull market and we will be for years to come. So that's, that's my take. Right. You know, of course the long-term trend is up, but the, the bigger question on everyone's mind, whether you are in an OG or someone new is was 6,000 the bottom. Uh, you know, hopefully 8,000 was the bottom or whatever. But, you know, the, the big question, if someone says, is this 
bear market over is did we bottom okay or or is there a chance that we're going uh, to go lower now to me the first thing i look at is again i i worked on wall street many many years i'm a cfa for 20 years i look at actual facts and the facts always start with the fundamental analysis and that's you know people you should listen to the the one-on-one -on -one i did with ronnie most a couple of weeks ago he's the same way as he as i we of course look at technical analysis it's part it's a it's a useful tool in a arsenal uh, uh, but it's not the end all be all fundamentals are always first. And when you look at Bitcoin, uh, you know, there's a, there are many reasons that, that you and I both know Zach, why it's worth a lot more now than it was a year ago, starting with, uh, seg with the victory and the scaling, uh, debate, the fact that, that we couldn't, they couldn't, uh, break the network with hard forks, et cetera. And now the technological innovation, of course, what's going on in the legacy markets, uh, as debt explodes and, uh, emerging market currencies fall. And the money printing doesn't stop, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you know, the, the two things that I look at most of, you know, whether we bottomed at six thousand, are are they're simple. I mean, let's face it. The reason we got to six thousand in the first place was because of a capitulatory selling based on the Mount Gox whale. It's that simple. His biggest sale, which was probably, and then I mean, he on the on February sixth, which was the low, he actually took. 8,000 Bitcoin out of his wallet. And that very day on probably the second biggest uh, day of, of trading ever, we capitulated to 6,000. There was no doubt anyone who was there that day knows what a capitulation looks like. That's what it was. And he was the driving force behind it. And the second part is that it's not a coincidence, as I've been saying from day one, that 6,000 or actually 5,970 was the low because that represents an exactly $100 billion market cap. That's the level where it becomes investable for all of the world's biggest deep pocket investors. Uh, that's when a lot of them started entering and it's no surprise that that's where they were waiting. So just on those two factors alone, when I throw in the fundamentals, I say, I say to myself, I can't imagine with all that's going on in Bitcoin, what could possibly uh, make that price go lower? I mean, do you look at anything like that or is it, do you have a gut feel or are you just um, blown in the wind? Yeah, I think um, so. I, I'm definitely not uh, one of those individuals who thinks technical analysis is entirely garbage. I'm not particularly skilled at it, but I have a small pile of books on technical analysis that I'm sort of working my way through um, as time permits me with the thousands of other books that I want to read. Um, there's never mm -hmm. enough time in the day to read everything that should be read. Um, but I think focusing on fundamentals is probably more important, more important, maybe in like your long term, developing a long term thesis. So short term technical analysis might be and you can correct me if this is just an idiotic opinion, but technical analysis might be more helpful short term, but the fundamentals are crucial long term. And that's never more important than with Bitcoin. Um, if you are sort of afraid to buy Bitcoin right now, because you think the price might go lower by another thousand or even another like three or four thousand. Um, I would recommend maybe reconsidering that thesis because in my opinion, my thesis on Bitcoin is it is still phenomenally underpriced right now. And you don't need to take my word for that. Just look at the thesis of people like the Winklevoss brothers and um, the incredible research by the team over at Fundstrat and that sort of thing. And look at how they build their thesis, their theses on Bitcoin and how it should be priced. And even Mark Yusko, who I was chatting with earlier, um, how he prices Bitcoin. Um, he thinks it's underpriced until we reach four hundred thousand dollars per Bitcoin. Um, so a drop from six thousand dollars to three thousand dollars is meaningless if that price level, which is, I'll add, pretty low compared to some of the other uh, valuations we've seen from other people on how much a Bitcoin will be worth in the future and that sort of thing. That price fluctuation is meaningless. Um, and you should probably stick away from the technicals unless you're a pro like Andy, because you'll get just obliterated if you try and jump into Bitcoin and play the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week price fluctuations um, and try and turn a profit or something. You should probably just buy and hold. And uh, I forget where I first saw it, but it's been floating around all over the place. When I first got into Bitcoin, I remember like one of the first 10 articles I read was something about 
um, how the best way, and this was way before we had this just explosion of altcoins and people trying to trade it to accumulate more Bitcoin and that sort of thing. But they said the best thing you can do if you're in Bitcoin for the profit, like as in cashing out in USD or euros or whatever fiat currency your uh, nation uses, is to just buy Bitcoin and not touch it. Because if you touch it, odds are you'll probably come away with less Bitcoin than when you first started. Um, so that's my advice too. Right. I would recommend reconsidering if you have a bearish thesis short term right now. And I would recommend if you buy Bitcoin to just not touch it and you will likely be better off in the future. So yes, but buying old is the best strategy for essentially everything out there. Uh, and you know, you called me an expert, I'm no expert, but then again, there's uh, there's not much to know. If you, uh, you know, what I'm an expert in is having a mosaic of, of an analytical skills. And uh, that's just one of them. Uh, it's not my expertise, but I've been around long enough to know what technical analysis is. And I certainly uh, use it, um, you know, it's just part of the, all the things I look at. But most importantly, the, the, the one number you need to know is that $160 billion is the market cap for Bitcoin. Uh, if you truly believe it's a new emerging asset class for whatever reason, whether it's digital gold or the new money of the future, we're going into a digital age. And you see that there's 300 trillion dollars of legacy financial market assets there and we're 160 billion dollars which is like 0. 0.00001 if you think that that's overvalued that that's a bubble then don't invest in bitcoin uh but particularly if you have bitcoin already so you you know you've been in for a while and you have gains and you're with house money anyway why would you even consider doing anything everything is great in bitcoin land i don't wake up worried about anything at all okay next I want to talk about an even more important topic than the unknowable timing of price movements, which is the role of altcoins as the Bitcoin dominated digital age unfolds. Mm. Now, as longtime listeners know well, I have been as diehard of a Bitcoin maximalist with quotes around it as they come. Not quite uh, as maximalist as, say, Tone Bays, JD Weatherman, or Cypher Dean Amos, who, for all intents and purposes, have an extremely bleak outlook for the altcoin sector. To the contrary, while I have long said that 90 plus percent of altcoins are worthless, the primary tenet of my personal maximalism has more to do with how I invest than whether I believe altcoins can succeed. Personally, particularly after 15 years in precious metals, when I sold my last mining stock nine years in, given their dramatically weaker reward risk profile than physical metal, I only invest fiat currency in Bitcoin with the understanding that while some or perhaps many altcoins will outperform, the incremental risk isn't worth it to me, particularly when I'm also receiving free crypto dividends in the process. However, particularly in light of altcoins powerful recovery from the February market lows, I'm now starting to realize that not only are altcoins here to stay, but that many will dramatically outperform Bitcoin with the caveat that many more will dramatically underperform as like the dot coms in the late 90s few actually have viable sustainable use cases those that directly compete with bitcoin will likely be squashed like bugs but those that find niches investors attribute value to could in my view be some of the best investments of the coming decade on a risk adjusted basis of course to that end zach tell us your view of the altcoin sector in general and if the recent bubble and burst cycle has altered it, are you a Bitcoin maximalist? And if so, how do you define Bitcoin maximalism? Yeah, that's a, a great question. <laughs> Bitcoin maximalism is um, one of my favorite things to talk about in, in the Bitcoin space. Um, and before I share my opinions, I'll give a little bit plug. Um, Pierre Richard gave a great talk yesterday yesterday um called bitcoin maximalism is it dead and you can go on twitter on his feed my feed um just search i guess for that title and you should watch it it's a great talk he shares a lot of important thoughts um i think <clears throat> i think one of the most misunderstood aspects of bitcoin maximalism is that it's not a descriptor of someone's portfolio per se it's an ideology a dogma of how you view monetary policy and the game of creating money and maximalism maximalists whether you're an ethereum maximalist which i i guess i've seen called an ethereum realist recently um i'm not entirely sure what that what an ethereum realist means but it, i may be related to a maximalist i'm not sure um but if you're a maximalist of any coin you simply think that 
the game is zero sum and your coin will be the winner. Um, but what you hold, what cryptocurrencies, altcoins, tokens you hold doesn't necessarily violate your thesis on monetary policy that will win out long term. You can trade to try and accumulate more Bitcoin. That's a perfectly valid um, expression of maximalism. Um, you can hold a majority of altcoins in your portfolio and only have a little bit of Bitcoin. Um, and I think that's still you can legitimately call yourself a maximalist, even though you probably have a much larger appetite for what I might call reckless or needless risk in your investment, given that I think part of the maximalist ideology is that altcoins will eventually lose out to Bitcoin or can never at least overtake Bitcoin. Um, I think a maximalist probably would always hold at least some Bitcoin um, and never have a complete altcoin portfolio. But you can hold and trade altcoins and be a maximalist because a ma maximalism doesn't describe your portfolio. It describes your opinion on monetary policy. Um, and to spoil Pierre's talk for you, Bitcoin maximalism is not dead. Um, I think nothing, nothing that exists right now will overtake Bitcoin. Um, and it's just as simple as that. We can't make with any certainty predictions about the future. Um, I should say without 100% certainty. I'm relatively certain. Um, but nothing that exists right now can overtake Bitcoin. And anything that exists right now could be better at one or two or any number of things relative to Bitcoin, but we'll still lose out to Bitcoin because Bitcoin was first. Bitcoin is good enough in all areas and no altcoin is better at everything that Bitcoin is good enough at than Bitcoin, if that makes sense. Um, so that, <laughs> that was sort of a jumbled answer. I'm a hardcore maximalist. I have held some altcoins and traded them and that sort of thing. And filing taxes on that broke my brain, essentially. <laughs> um, but if you're a maximalist and you hold altcoins, you're still just as much of a maximalist as Syfdeen, who probably would cut off his right hand before he bought Ethereum or <laughs> uh, uh, Verge or Tron or some other token or coin out there. So right, that's my right. take. Yeah, well, I mean, look, to me, the the only the real uh, definition that matters is anyone who believes that Bitcoin um, will be the only uh, cryptocurrency to have a true digital gold function uh, that's universally recognized around the world. If you believe that Bitcoin cannot maintain that that leadership, that dominance, you are not a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, to me, the only people who are not uh are anyone who would be involved with bcash and i'm not talking about zombies who just follow raja ver and trade i'm talking about if you actually are one of the people in that realm who actually believe that like bcash comically so could usurp bitcoin in that function i guess you are not a bitcoin maximalist and i think most of the people who are trading altcoins has nothing to do with maximalism it has to do with just liking to do high risk trading activities um, sure. is it, you know but like you said it's a it's a philosophy and either you believe that bitcoin will be the digital gold uh leader which it is right now without any competition or that it will be usurped either by another cryptocurrency or another form of money if you are if you believe that then you're not a maximalist otherwise everything else uh is just noise uh, like i said from a trading trading just from an investing standpoint forget the word trading uh, if you want to invest in Verge and Tron, go for it. You have huge risks involved. Again, it's risk adjusted uh, upside is massive. You could buy Tron at a dollar and watch it go to a hundred dollars. You can also buy Tron at a dollar and uh, and in a week watch it go down to twenty cents. Um, it's that simple. Um, so yeah, Bitcoin maximalism is a far cry from uh, how you invest. It's a it's a philosophy which I believe in strongly. That's why I was in gold all those years, because I believed that gold was the only asset in the world that had any kind of monetary value that would stand the test of time. Uh, and well, for one, the government kind of destroyed it with paper money. But more importantly, Bitcoin came along and destroyed gold. And right now, I can't imagine anything else that's going to change that uh, that relationship going forward. Now, next up on this topic, something I prefer not discussing, given how violently nauseous it makes me. I'd say I've already wasted too much time on it in the past year, given how immaterial it has ultimately turned out to be. However, it cannot be understated how important Bitcoin's battle and irreversible Waterloo-like victory over the vile scam coin Bcash has been. Per what I wrote in yesterday's tweet, 
If crypto is around a thousand years, it will never see a scam like Bcash. This week, while the Bitcoin Jesus turned Judas, spewed his comically transparent lies from a booth titled Bitcoin.com at the consensus conference, the fatally flawed crypto he sold his Bitcoin for hard forked for the third time in just nine months from, believe it or not, people, eight an eight megabyte block size to 32 megabyte block size, whilst adding smart contract capabilities to the world's dumbest cryptocurrency. Now, my friends, the average Bcash block size, nearly a year after its Rosemary's baby-like inception, during which no less than a half dozen coordinated raids on Bitcoin were executed with the help of every filth-ridden bad actor in the cryptocurrency community, the average block size in Bcash is 0 0.2 megabytes, all of which I can say with 100% certainty is related to trading. In other words, no one uses Bcash for anything other than speculation, and yet the carnival barker that runs it with the help of the who's who of cryptocurrency thugs actually claims to be rapidly gaining acceptance at Bitcoin's expense. To that end, Bcash raising its block size limit to 32 megabytes is the equivalent of a baseball team of toddlers increasing the amount of players on the field from nine to 9,000 because they think that will help them beat the Yankees. Zach, if you are unexpectedly a Bcash supporter, I'm sure we'll have a lively discussion in the coming minutes. But irrespective, tell us your view of whether Bcash's unprecedented third hard bore, which I might add, was not performed by 20% of the entire Bcash network, as if, it, as if that matters, represents in your view a jump the shark moment at a time when comically it trades for a whopping 15% of Bitcoin. Or conversely, do you see something positive in this move for Bcash adoption, functionality, or its ability to maintain such a high valuation relative to Bitcoin? Yeah, um, <laughs> Bcash <laughs> is definitely quite quite the topic. Um, as an aside, I'll add, I'm also pretty much a wholehearted supporter of referencing it as Bitcash. Um, and I found out a couple weeks ago, there's actually an altcoin called Bcash. That's its proper name. So the confusion- Is, it, is that right? Is it an actual Bcash? Yeah, um, it's, <laughs> it, the confusion is just limitless. Um, and it's important also to remember that we don't hate, oh, I guess I should speak for myself, although I, I would imagine you share the opinion, we don't hate Bitcoin Cash because it's a fork of Bitcoin. Y you can fork Bitcoin right now if we wanted to on this show, and that's not a malicious attack on Bitcoin. It's not a bad thing to do. It's probably pointless and a waste of your time and will do nothing productive for the network. And so in that sense, maybe bad. But the problem is the scamming that accompanied the fork and the attack on the shelling point of the crypto space, which is Bitcoin, trying to hijack the point of Bitcoin in words, which in reality was never done because people just didn't accept the fork. Um, I think it's comical that Roger Veer hasn't told us which Bitcoin Cash fork is the real Bitcoin Cash, which all with all of his um, opining on Bitcoin Cash being the real Bitcoin. We don't know which one to follow if you're a Bitcoin Cash supporter. Um, and I'm generally 110% bearish on Bitcoin Cash uh, into the future, all of the forks. And most of the forks of Bitcoin, too. I think um, I was chatting with Giacomo Zucco about how you should experiment with something that maybe you want to change about Bitcoin without getting a, a pull request committed to the Bitcoin code. Um, and you could start your own blockchain, you could fork Bitcoin, um, you could do any number of things. But I think maybe forking Bitcoin is probably the best way to do it instead of just creating your whole new chain and adding to all of those useless chains out there. Um, and which, again, goes to the point that forking Bitcoin is not a problem. It can be very useful if you want to sort of experiment with something and see if it's a viable uh, bit of code to utilize in the future and maybe improve Bitcoin with. Um, but yes, bearish on Bitcoin Cash. I think it's just nonsense. Um, uh, Rodolfo Novak tweeted, has tweeted several times that it's just not even a threat to Bitcoin anymore to the extent that it's just not even worth talking about. Like if Bitcoin Cash was any threat to Bitcoin, it would have done damage right now. Now, at this point, it's just an annoyance. It's slidden so far into irrelevance that 
it's just an annoyance um, and not there are so many other things that we can spend our time on productively instead of beating Bitcoin cash, which is now just a, a dead horse and will never be will never be revived. Um, right. Right. And I, and, I, and I bring it up today, though, because these this is major stuff. I mean, there oh, yeah. you know, we had the consensus conference where they, you know, they choose to do this this third hard fork during it. And of course, there are other big Bcash event starts tomorrow in Hong Kong with all, you know, the, the usual actors. So, you know, they're, they're doing more of their propaganda games. It doesn't phase me like it used to, because, yes, the 15 percent of Bitcoin is appalling, uh, you know, and as it comes back to Adam and his 80 percent of thing, there are. The vast majority of people listen to demagogues like that, even if they make no sense at all. So yes, it gets to 15% of Bitcoin when all the other forks, which do absolutely nothing different, they're all equally useless, whether it's be diamond or be gold or, or the all the other ones, except they trade for nothing. And you know, so I don't mind the 15% as long as it doesn't do what it used to do, which is it caused Bitcoin to fall when they were going up. Right now, Bitcoin. Uh, you know, it underperforms Bcash, but as long as it's not plunging while Bcash is going up, I really don't care because eventually I know that that 15% uh, premium is going to go away. There's just no way that you can sustain this this lunacy forever. I mean, you can fool only some people some of the time or much of the people some of the time, but you can't fool them all the time. And uh, But again, I don't invest in either one, uh, long or short, so I really don't care. I just bring it up for people to realize, you know, anytime you do hear the propaganda, we're talking about they have a 32 megabyte block size, which if you you know you listen to my one on one with, uh, for instance, Rocky Palumbo, where he just shows you, you literally big blocks don't scale. I mean, it's impossible. So they're going bigger, four times bigger when the fact is that they literally have no volume to start with. Uh, but um, yeah. just just thought I'd bring it up, especially because. No, yeah. Yeah. Go. Yeah. No, I think. Um... It, it, my opinion, at least on big blocks, is that they aren't just like forks. They aren't bad per se. And yeah. on the Bitcoin blockchain, we may see in the future. I, I think it's more likely than not that we will see some sort of block size increase. Um, but Bitcoin Cash wanted to be an experiment in big blocks right now to overtake Bitcoin. And my objection isn't with isn't necessarily with the technical profile of bitcoin cash it's with the lies and the scams and an experiment is worthless if the people running it are constantly lying about it to the public and that is what bitcoin cash is so big blocks i don't think they're necessarily bad we pro we more likely than not will see them in the future with bitcoin uh with the real bitcoin um but right now bitcoin cash is just a mess of lies and scams and shady people and that's why it will die, not necessarily because of the technicals, although those those don't really help either at, at the moment. Yeah. And I, too, I mean, I don't care. You can fork all you want. I just think they're useless. I think that the, yeah. the worst. Right. I mean, I think it's been proven that the diminishing returns are more importantly, you just look at them and go, they're all basically copies of Bitcoin. Like, why would I want to own them? They don't none of them do anything any different and anything that they do try a Bitcoin will just do. But, you know, if you want to fork, go for it. But um, if you attack Bitcoin. You're going to face the wrath of the community. It's that simple. All right. End of story. Next, a topic that has gotten a lot of buzz at this week's New York Consensus Conference, validating what I have been saying for some time, which is custodial solutions for institutional cryptocurrency holders, uh, as introduced this week by Coinbase and also Ledger X, uh, with its mainstream partner, Nomura of Japan. And trust me, it's no coincidence that the largest securities company in Japan, which is the most uh, Bitcoin accepting nation in the world, certainly on the government level, is the company that's that's taking this plunge, uh, this plunge or this plan <laughs> moving into this, because this can be a very uh, you know far reaching solution for the institutions. Now, since institutions started wading into crypto, uh, once Bitcoin achieved that hundred billion dollar market cap in the fall, it's sort of been considered the way I see things as common knowledge in the Bitcoin community that a lack of safe, regulated custodial solutions would prove a hindrance to widespread adoption. You know, kind of the, the thought of like a hedge fund manager running like a billion dollars, buying Bitcoin and putting on a Trezor is kind of the, the, the vision people would have. Uh, but to the contrary, I, I don't think it's I think it's a marginal issue at best with the bigger issue simply being that demand for this very non-mainstream asset class uh, just hasn't been high enough. I mean, the GBDC Bitcoin fund 
Uh, and they are easily one of the world's largest Bitcoin holders. And they even did a, a distribution of their Bcash to, uh, to, to shareholders. They've been doing this for some time. Uh, so, you know, to that end, Zach, do you believe custody is a significant hurdle to bit for Bitcoin to bridge on the road to institutional adoption? And do this week's product introductions from Coinbase and Ledger X Nomura alleviate this concern going forward? Oh, oh boy, that's a <laughs> big topic. I think um, I think custody for retail investors, uh, custody services, obviously someone like Coinbase uh, or any of these other exchanges, holding your Bitcoins is just symptomatic of how um, immersed we are in someone else handling our financial matters for us and how unaccustomed we sort of as a civilization are at present to um, individual financial responsibility and exchanges are a crutch. I don't, the centralized exchanges are a crutch. Custodial services are a crutch that will eventually be rendered useless as we increasingly realize the power you have uh, when you have complete control over your financial assets. Um, I don't store any, uh, I shouldn't say any, maybe like two or three percent of bitcoin on centralized services um and that's just if i want to buy something or send some to a friend or a new bitcoin adopter or something like that and that was definitely not the case when i first got into bitcoin um, and hopefully my journey from realizing that the problems with that is something that a lot most retail investors all retail investors who hodl bitcoin will go through as far as institutional investors though um there were stories floating around about that um, old Swiss army bunker or whatever that's been turned into a vault by Zappa where people store millions or billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And that's just a, uh, as Preston Byrne pointed out, that's just a fancy Coinbase. Like you don't own the private keys for the coin, uh, Bitcoin stored in that vault. It's pretty badass in my opinion, pretty badass way to store your Bitcoin, but still it's not your Bitcoin in the truest sense of uh, an understanding of ownership of Bitcoin. Um, but institutional investors, at, at least now, sort of want some surety that someone will take care of their Bitcoin for them, although I think that will change in the future and they'll want more control over the Bitcoin that they hold um, or that they nominally own. Um, I think it's just a temporary phase all around. Yeah, that um, custodial services for Bitcoin will be phased out. They will not last because the like the chief selling point of Bitcoin is that you can own this financial asset and no one can touch it. You can own it 100%, do whatever you want with it, and no one can say otherwise. Um, and investing in Bitcoin without holding to that idea of Bitcoin, it just really is incongruous. It doesn't make much sense and it's not a long-term viable thesis. It's not a, it's not a long-term viable way to approach Bitcoin. Um, whether you're an institutional investor or a retail investor. So if that makes sense, that's my take. I realize the answer was sort of jumbled, but I think whether for a retail investor or institutional investor, custodial services are a short-term thing that will be phased out and beaten out as people increasingly realize the importance of holding everything you own on your own and not letting someone else manage it for you. Right, right. I'm talking about the short term versus the long term. Because here, you know, with this conversation, it's the difference between the philosophy of Bitcoin and the financial reality of institutions who at this point couldn't care less about the philosophy uh yeah. neither do the 80 percent. they simply want to make money and if they deem bitcoin to be valuable but the the hindrance is that there's no regulated way to do it or safe way to do it uh then they wouldn't do it uh, and my contention is that look gbtc has been doing it for a while stocks have been held in street name forever uh coinbase has been one of the largest holders of of uh of, of bitcoin itself coinbase and all these other ones it's the same thing. I mean, you know, it's a, just a matter of, you know, do you trust it uh, for your personal investments, which is what Coinbase is, and would you trust a, a third party entity and will the government allow it uh, in a regulatory standpoint uh, for, for other people's money? Uh, and, you know, it's it's um, it's funny you mentioned that bunker in Switzerland, which I'm sure it is true. And actually, that does kind of make sense, because, again, everyone in the world owns Bitcoin doesn't own it for the same reasons. Everyone who owns gold doesn't own it because they think it's the end of the world. Some just think it's a valuable asset uh, that's or undervalued. I mean, so there are going to be some very wealthy people uh, or high profile owners, let's say, who do own 
hundreds of millions of dollars of it and they want it safeguarded. They don't want it. Uh, well, they don't want to you know, memorize private keys in their head and they don't want a safe in their house. So there will be people who entrust the equivalent of uh, Brinks as we did in the gold business uh, for, for the Bitcoin. And that will make sense for some people um, that, that I'm just talking about the bigger picture of our hedge funds not in it right now because there's no way of doing it. Like that's like they, their charters won't allow them to invest. And, you know, now that Coinbase is offering a service, now that Ledger X with Nomura, which is a very legitimate uh, firm is offering it, I think it's only a matter of time before they all offer it. And if the price, uh, if we go into a new bull phase and the price goes up a lot, there's more interest. I think you'll look up, uh, let's say that happens this year, and by year end, there'll be 25 of the world's largest uh, financial institutions offering this from Goldman Sachs on down. Uh, so look, people can disagree on this. I just think that it's inevitable that, that custody is a small issue. As you say, in the long term, I think as Bitcoin becomes more of a philosophy, as people understand that it's something that's, that, that could replace what we currently have, then you're going to see more and more uh, personal solutions. But right now, this is the, the short-term focus of the big money. So finally, the question I've been asking to all the one-on-one -on -one guests in recent months, which I'm eager to get Zach's response to, which is Black Swan events notwithstanding, what he, as in you, Zach, anticipates in the Bitcoin and altcoin markets in the second half of the year. In other words, when 2018 is in the books, what do you think the year's biggest crypto stories will have been? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't necessarily think it will be something price related per se, as in uh, we reach some, we may very well reach some astronomically high uh, or new astronomically high all time high. Um, I think it's, more likely than not probably within before the calendar year is over um but i don't think that will be the biggest story i think bitcoin will continue to be um be beleaguered which is giving more credit to the threats than they deserve but will still continually to continue to be assailed by sort of social threats um which i think are a the way the bitcoin is most frequently attacked rather than technical problems or threats or weaknesses or something um, whether it's by increasing attempts at competition via altcoins or government policies banning it or making it trying to make it more difficult to use um, or something like that or whether it's um, a continued ontage of um, public slandering a bitcoin by billionaires or um important uh, global political talking heads um or any of that sort of thing um as far as like positive news for bitcoin over the next year i i don't know i honestly couldn't take a guess maybe the fact that bitcoin cash dies once and for all and something explosive comes out about roger veer and the whole project just sort of goes up in um one big uh, puff of smoke um well, that, that, that's not on my radar, but boy, would that be a dream scenario? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not I'm not giving a great answer here. I think it will. I think I mean, I, every day I think I can't be more bullish about Bitcoin, but then I wake up in the morning and somehow I am. Um, and that's not necessarily because of the price. I think as I think you would agree long term, the price doesn't really matter because the price is just an exchange rate compared to a shitty fiat currency that we could all our lives would be better off without. Um, but the development of Bitcoin, the adoption of Bitcoin, all of that stuff, um, I'm only ever more bullish about. Um, actually, one thing I think that could be great for Bitcoin this year is the increasing use of decentralized exchanges like BISC and HODL HODL. Um, their volume over the past couple months even has been just exploding. Um, and I, I love both of those teams so much. Um, they're a little bit different on the technical side of how decentralized they are, but they're both some of the most decentralized exchange, BISC being 100% decentralized. Um, and if you don't, it, anyone listening doesn't use either of them or aren't familiar with those projects, definitely check them out. They're excellent. And uh, I love what I'm seeing right now with how much they're being used. And I am I can only hope that that will continue. So probably increasing use of decentralized exchange is something I'd love to see most in uh, the next coming months. Right. Well, I mean, look, to sum up what you just said, you said you expect that throughout the year, Bitcoin will continue to be beleaguered as much as ever. In fact, you spent a good deal of time talking about all the things that will beleaguer. At the same time, you said 
there's a more likely than not chance that we hit a new all time high. So yes. uh, if so, the point is the attacks on Bitcoin will increase, but so will its uh, immunity to those attacks, its anti fragility, and that is your answer. So with that, we will conclude today's podcast featuring one of the top up and coming commentators in the crypto sphere, Zach Vol, who can be reached at Zach Vol, spelled Z A C K V O E L L, and at the Coin Pod, where he does weekly free cryptocurrency related podcasts. As for me, please check out the free seven-day trial membership at CryptoGoldCentral.com uh, or contact me at ahoffman at CryptoGoldCentral.com related to uh, consultations of any kind. Thanks very, very much and have a great crypto day. Thanks, Andy.